Hey guys, welcome to uh, joining us this morning for uh, worship with King's Cross Church. My name is Jacob, and I had the privilege of being the lead pastor here. If you're looking to connect with somebody or talk through uh, what's going on around in the world around us, I don't have any uh, silver bullet answers, but I'd love to talk with you. And if you would like to connect with somebody to talk about Jesus or to pray with you, we have a whole church of people that are eager to do that. You can contact us through the church website uh, on the contact form, or you can just message us on the Facebook page. With that being said, we're going to turn now and hear from God's word as he calls us into his presence together to worship. From Psalm 68, verses 32 to 35. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary. The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. As we worship this morning, I pray that you would experience God's pleasure and God's joy in giving you power and strength in Jesus Christ. Would you stand and join us in worshiping God this morning? at the fall running away when I hear you call but Father you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne but Father you loved me still and in love before you laid the world's foundation
forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was love is deeper than the depths of sin and hell. He who was enthroned in glory came to bring us to himself. My Redeemer's love is wider than the breach my sins had made. reached down into my darkness. He alone has power to save. Deeper than the rolling seas, higher than the mountain peaks, your love is Redeemer's love is stronger than my fiercest enemies. He will hold me in the tempest. Through the flood he carries me. My Redeemer's love will lead me through the deepest valley. shepherd me and 
guide me. He will ever keep me near. Deeper than the rolling sea. love grows sweeter as eternity draws near. I'll enjoy his love forever at his throne for endless years. My Redeemer's love will fill me on the day I see his face. morning, our scripture reading comes from Genesis 24, verses 34 through 38, 42 through 49, and 58 through 67. So he said, I am Abram's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys, And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he was given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are proposing the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out, and with her water jar on her shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give you your camel's drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camel's drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son whom Micah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord. 
the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they went away, Rebekah with their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his man. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands and thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Laroi and was dwelling in Negeb. And Isaac went out to meditate in the, field, or in the field toward the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when he saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And now we'll read from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. And let us pray. Father God, and Son, Jesus Christ, and Spirit who is with us, Lord, we thank you for this assurance that you've given us, that you came and met us in this world, and you brought us truth. And we have that assurance in you, Lord, that we are with you. And we thank you for that, Lord. During these trying times, that comfort, the, the knowledge of, of you and, and your grace that you extend, and the assurance from that, Lord, is very comforting. Lord, we lift up the uh, health and wellness of our brother Bill. Lord, we know that uh, the progress he's made in this past week is, uh, is a miracle in itself, Lord. We are so thankful for your provisions and guidance in, uh, in helping to in healing his heart, Lord. And now as there are concerns over uh, his 
brain function, Lord. Uh, and um, Lord, we just ask for guidance for the doctors, and we ask for your hand in healing in brain's mind in Bill's mind. Lord, we ask that you would heal him and wake him up, Lord. But we rest secure knowing that whatever your will is for Bill, that he, uh, that he is secure in you, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, we also today lift up Hope Tabernacle here in Manchester and Pastor John Rivera, Lord. We are so thankful for their partnership, uh, for the friendship between Pastor Rivera and Pastor Jacob, um, and for the ways that they have supported us throughout this uh, pandemic, Lord, and providing space for us to meet at times. Lord, we ask a blessing on their church, protection for their congregants, Lord, and uh, wisdom for John Rivera as they plan and uh, figure out how to go about reopening in a wise and uh, beneficial way for their congregants, Lord. We lift up, uh, we ask that uh, you would give John Rivera encouragement, Lord, as uh, it's particularly difficult for pastors who are used to connecting uh, personally on a regular basis with their congregants, Lord, and that's quite a challenge in these times, Lord. Give him the endurance uh, to continue to run the race and to care for your flock, Lord. Lord, we lift up Grace Church in Frisco, Texas, and Pastor Craig Cabanis, Lord. We ask the same provisions uh, for his church family. Uh, I don't know if they are open or not, Lord, but um, we just ask for wisdom through these times, for peace for the congregants who uh, are um, no doubt feeling a variety of emotions and disconnectedness, Lord, that they would know that you are near and uh, that they would be able to find uh, creative ways to continue to build your body and to live out being the body of uh, body of Christ and the church in this world, Lord. And lastly, uh, we ask for these same provisions for the Sherbrooke Church in Quebec, Canada, Pastor Mike Pylon, Lord. We thank you for this uh, network and family of churches, Lord, that, uh, that your church is global, that you love uh, all cultures and all, all people, Lord. You, <laughs> not only do you love them, Lord, you created all of this, and that is um, fantastic and uh, awe-inspiring, Lord. Um, Lord, we lift up this message that Jacob has for us, Lord. Ask that it would speak into our hearts and uh, that we would be refreshed and renewed by the word you have for us today. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, thanks for joining us this morning um, as we worship Jesus together. We're going to continue uh, to worship God. Um, now that we've sung his praises and heard from his word and responded in prayer, we're going to get a few updates as a church, and then we're going to turn to God's word together. As I said before, my name is Jacob. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here, and I, it's a joy to be able to worship Jesus with you. Obviously, we're in this virtual context, and Lord willing, um, we will find a way out of this um, in the days ahead, uh, but we want to do that safely and carefully. And we want to do that together as we love Jesus together as a church. That's what we're all about. That's what we do as a church. Um, so if you are joining us for the first time or if you are a part of the community and looking for a church, um, we are building around this basic idea of loving Jesus together. We're doing that virtually right now. Um, but we have had God open our hearts and eyes to see Jesus and the love of God in his face for us. Um, and so we are a church that are committed not being perfect people and not having it all together, not even having all the best answers, but loving Jesus and loving him together. And so we do that here on Sunday mornings um, when we get together to worship him. And then we do that through the week as well. Um, we have our small groups. We call them missional communities, and they meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights. Uh, Tuesday night, we have one at 6 and one at 8, one at, on Wednesday at 7, and one on Thursday at 7. Uh, those groups are all on Zoom right now. Um, if you would like to join one of those groups, if you're a guest or you're just trying to find a church, uh, please email us and we'll get you the uh, Zoom link for those meetings. Um, and in those meetings right now, they look like processing and thinking through the sermon 
passage, studying God's word together, getting updates and praying for each other. Uh, some of us, our group, we played a online game um, that I terribly lost in our small group, and we play games together. And then we uh, we just try to be in this context as much as we can, uh, continue to build our friendships together. Um, if those are interesting to you, again, message us, and we'd be happy to get that to you. Um, one of the things that I wanted just to put on your radar is our prayer meeting. We've had uh, prayer meetings kind of interspersed, but we've been committed to having one on Sunday nights. Um, I really would encourage you to make the time to be able to join us at 8 o'clock tonight for our prayer meeting. Um, that is a time where we can bring our burdens and struggles, needs, and um, everything else to God and pray together. Pray for the week ahead. Pray for the, the people in our church that need help. Um, pray for our neighbors and our city together. Please join us for that prayer meeting. That's at 8 o'clock. That's going to be at every every Sunday night moving forward, as we've had for the last month and a half, two months or so. But um, if you can make the time, that would be really great, and it would be a great way for us to continue to stir our dependence on God together as a church. Um, apart from that, uh, one of the things I want to mention is that we uh, worship God through giving. If you have uh, financial distress going on right now, as we have consistently said through this, please feel no obligation to give. But we uh, would encourage you, if you can, kingscross.com slash donate, or I'm sorry, slash giving as the way in which you can continue to give to the church to support our life together. Um, that continues to support us. Even though we're in this virtual context, there is a number of decisions that we're needing to make to maintain our life together. And that and your giving continues to support us as we make those decisions and as we make those adjustments as a church and continue to join Jesus' mission. So when you give, you're not giving to um, make your conscience better, but you are giving primarily to join and support God's mission through King's Cross Church here. Um, if you would like to give to our Benevolence Fund, we are continuing to distribute those funds to those in need in our community. And that is one way that you can do that. Obviously, you can do that on your own if you'd like, but you can do that through the church as well by going to the donate uh, to the giving page and then selecting the Benevolence Fund and the options there. Uh, last thing before we get into God's Word together, uh, or last couple things, a couple uh, just comments is that obviously we are continuing to pray for Bill. Um, the reality is that Bill is still recovering from this massive um, cardiac situation and emergency that he's had. Um, we're currently praying for Bill uh, to recover um, full, not only physical health, but mental and spiritual health as well. And so we will continue to send you updates. I want to keep those um, more, um, so to speak, in the church community and not just make those public on this because, Lord willing, uh, one day Bill will watch through all these services and not be uh, ghastly offended at everything that we've said about him. So <laughs> we want to just say we're continuing to pray for Bill, continue to pray for him. If you want to get updates, please contact me, and I'll get you on our email list for those updates. Um, in terms of our movement forward as a church, we're in a virtual setting right now, obviously. Um, as the state has continued to kind of give more definition and guidelines for places of worship uh, to reopen, we are very cautiously and carefully trying to process each of those steps and what that will look like. I sent a survey out this last week, and I would very much like to have everybody respond to that to help us get a sense of where everybody's at in the church uh, with the questions of reopening. So uh, I think most people have responded to that. If you have not, please respond by tomorrow. I need that information. Um, it just helps me get a sense of what, uh, what are people thinking, where are the questions, concerns, and how we can construct a plan that's safe um, and careful for everybody's uh, for everybody in the church moving forward. Uh, I hope that you hear that our primary concern with that, whatever plan that we put together, is your safety. And we want to put a plan together that primarily emphasizes health, safety, and plans moving forward. And so please help us with that. Uh, as I've said before, and I just want to make sure this is clear, um, when we do make a plan to move forward, it will be in coordination with the Hope Center with where we, meet, where we meet for worship on Sunday mornings, and it will very likely be a week or two after they open their normal operations in whatever way they open them. So that being said, we're probably looking at uh, July at this point for moving towards an in-person option for, for worship. Um, that's the as most that I can say just because... Everybody's trying to figure this out together. I hope you can appreciate there's a lot of different conversations that have to happen to make that happen. 
But at this point, even if Hope Center opens mid to late June, that means that with our one to two week kind of delay, we will very likely be into July when we get together for Sunday worship. With that being said, we're now going to pick up in the book of Ecclesiastes and turn to God's word together. Hey guys, we're going to continue to hear from uh, God's word together as we worship. And before we get started, uh, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 3 this morning, and I'm going to pray for us, and then we will uh, dig into this passage together. I'm going to read the passage as we work through it, rather than reading the whole chapter up front, but this is a famous passage of the seasons, a time to be born and a time to die. It talks about all of these different aspects of our life together, and so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start looking at this together. Uh, Father, as we look at your word this morning, and we... Uh, Consider the seasons of life that you have set for us in your word. Um, We're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes 3, and we pray that as we see all of your many good gifts to us, that we would respond, that we would experience humble joy in our life under your care. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's appropriate that we're talking about seasons this morning as we look at Ecclesiastes 3, uh, because we are, as many of you have probably felt this last week, kind of on the edge of going from one season to the next. It feels like winter held on uh, for far too long, and then now suddenly um, lurching into late spring and early summer. Uh, I'm not sure if you have seen your lilac bushes around, but as Peter directed us earlier in the series, um, we have been walking around our neighborhood and other people in our family have been sticking their faces in lilac bushes. Um, I don't because I don't. Nobody can tell me what to do. But should I submit to Peter's recommendation, um, I would stick my face my face into a lilac bush as well. We've got lilacs all over the place, and not only do we have the normal seasons changing, but we have been th- suddenly thrown into this whole uh, what feels like an eternal pandemic season. I'm sure you feel that way as well. It. Uh, It feels like this is, when is this ever going to end? But this season will end and we will have another season of life. We sometimes will talk about what's going on in our lives as, you know, this is a season for this or a season for that. And that whole idea of how we frame our lives in terms of seasons comes from this passage, most importantly, in the Bible. Uh, This passage talks about various seasons of life and God's good gifts to us and What this passage is all about, rather than responding with fear and anxiety to the seasons that seem to be out of our control and change all of our lives together, uh, this passage is primarily focused on how do we calibrate our lives to respond appropriately to how God has designed the seasons of our lives to change. Um, We don't want to be tossed around um, like a flag in the wind or a kite in the sky uh, with our emotions to every season, what do we do now? What do we do now? This season um, and all seasons are designed for us to respond in humble joy to what God has given us. That doesn't mean that we don't experience pain or suffering or joy and happiness, but it means that at the root level in our response to who God is and what he's doing in our lives, he has designed each season for us to respond with humble joy. So here's the main point. If you want to follow along with the notes, the main point of this passage is Humble joy loves God's mighty works. That's what this passage is all about. That's what it's driving at. God's mighty works produces a humble joy in my life, for your life. It is designed so that whatever the season is, we receive it with humble joy. So what does humble joy look like? How do we process this world around us? How do we calibrate to the seasons of our lives so that we experience a humble joy wherever we are? Um, That's what this passage is all about. So if you join me, we're going to pick up here in verses 1 to 8, and the first thing we're going to see is that humble joy sings in life's seasons. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Time to cast away stones and time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. 
Uh, what this passage is uh, certainly resonating with is that there are various different uh, moments in life that feel like, well, depending on what's, uh, what is going on, I need to respond in a different way. Um, we read this passage and certainly it resonates with us. Like uh, a time to be born and a time to die, like there are different times in life. There are extremes. And one of the things as we read through this to note is that none of these moments really are um, sinful. Uh, these uh, moments, they have positive and negative qualities to them, but they are not inherently sinful in and of themselves. What the intent of this passage is not that you get to decide which season you're in. It's more about which season do you find yourself in. It's not about which one, ooh, I really want to be in this season. I want to be in the planting season. I really don't want to be in the harvest season because that's a lot of work uh, one way or the other. But the, the, the point of this passage is which season has God placed you in? And before we kind of um, delve deeply into which one has he placed you in, I want to re- rework through this passage and provide a little bit of some, some comments on what each phrase is aiming at. So just to start out in verse 2, a time to be born and a time to die, or a time for birthing, a time for having children, a time for when people are born, and a time for dying, a, a broad sense of, yes, each of us is going to die, but also there is a time for death um, happening in each of our families and each of our lives, wherever that is. So these are kind of polar opposites, right? A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. So you can apply this in many ways, right? There's the, the time for doing the hard sowing of, you know, I'm learning or I'm growing or I'm starting a business or I'm starting the beginning of something. And then there's times along the way where you harvest. And the thing about this phrase, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, you eventually then have to circle that back. You, you, you pluck what's been planted, right? You harvest what you've sown and then you re-sow it. So there's a cycle to this. A time to kill and a time to heal. Uh, this phrasing actually could be better phrased as or understood as demolishing and repairing, right? It's not saying like there's a time for all of you to go vigilante and just go nuts in your neighborhood and get rid of those people that you don't like. That's not what this is about. This is about there's a time for demolishing and there's a time, um, you know, we we see this all the time around the world and sometimes in our lives. There's a time where you just got to burn the whole thing down and start over, right? Whatever it is, right? Um, whether it's your company, you know, some, you know, we're, we live in the United States. We're coming up on July 4th, right? That was a time for revolution and starting things over, right? There is a time for those things, and then there's a time for repairing. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, right? There are times, right, that, that is sometimes where we have these sober moments where there is just absolute deep sadness. And then there's times for laughing, And some of the most offensive moments that we might experience is when somebody's laughing when they should be mourning. There is a time for each of those things that's appropriate. The the next phrase, there's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Psalm 30, verse 11, you have turned my mourning into dancing, right? This is all through the Bible where there is these moments where we do one and not the other. It's appropriate to laugh and dance and have fun at a wedding. It's appropriate to be sad and somber and reflective yet joyful at a funeral. There's these different moments in life, right? There is, he goes on, verse 5, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Some commentators um, comment that there may be a sexual undertone to this, uh, a time for embracing and a time for not embracing. Um, I'm not sure that that's really here, but the more important dynamic here is there is a time to gather together in, in the biblical times. There's a time to... You gather stones and you create a pillar as a, a memorial to a moment. And there's times where you don't do that. There's really nothing that special about what's going on. There's no birthdays. There's no anniversaries. There's a time just to be a normal life. A time to seek and a time to lose. Uh, or uh, You might frame this as a time to give up, a time to pursue something, and a time to say, you know what, we're done here. Actually, that phrase is used in uh, Jeremiah 30, 23, 1, with the Lord saying he's, he's done pursuing Israel. Right? So there's a time to pursue, and there's a time to say, you know what, Our, what we've tried to accomplish here, we're not doing this anymore. Uh, there's a time to keep and a time to cast away. Uh, all the minimalists in the room, they all look at this and they say, amen, because right? there's a time to cast away. They want to get rid of everything. Right? But there is a time to store up, right? 
Yeah, we just had a whole, uh, you know, pandemic run on all the toilet paper. Some people wish they had stored up more toilet paper. Some wish they had not stored up as much toilet paper. No, there is a time to, to gather. Um, if any of you have had any family that went through the Depression in the 1930s, um, there's a lingering feeling of, well, we need to store up and, and be frugal and make sure that we've got enough. But really, whenever it comes time to move, everybody thinks, I, I really wish that I had not gathered as much stuff. Right? There's a time for these things, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. You can think of this in terms of there's a time to speak up and say, this is not right. And there's another time to say, this is no longer worth our time. This is not going to change. We need to, hold, we need to keep our silence and move on. Right? Those are wisdom factors. And then the last phrase here, at time, uh, the, verse 8, it's, um, it's a bit of like a pyramid, right? A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace, right? A time for love and peace, um, they cap both ends, and then the middle of this phrase is a time for hate and a time for war, and in Paul Simon's famous song, Turn, 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 he adds a simple lyric, I swear it's not too late, right? There is a clear dynamic, which this, this seems to just kind of cover the whole range of what our life is. So now that we've kind of worked through all these phrases, here's the important thing to note about each one of these. God is the one who sets the season, right? We don't decide when summer begins or spring or fall, right? We love our weather apps here. Like I use dark skies on my phone. I want to control and know what the weather's going to be. And even this app, which is dialed into the best data possible, is not right. Right. We want to control which, which season of life we're in. Like we really want to be in this season or that season. And at the end of the day, it's the Lord himself, God, who determines which season we are in. Right? They oft, these, these ways of controlling which season we're in often disappoint. And often our deepest frustrations and unconscious wrestling in our lives is the reality that we can't control which season we're in. We don't like when we're in one of these negative seasons. We, we don't even think about it that much when we're in a good season, right? When we often don't think about, it's a good season to be in health, and I, I enjoy my health until we don't, we're sick, and we've got the cold or the flu or whatever, right? We don't get, get, to, get to control which season of life we're in. We can set a date for the wedding, but we can't determine when we have kids. We can set a business plan, but we can't control our customers, right? There is... Lots of ways in which we set plans, but we really don't determine which season we're in. And God himself determines that. And this often, this, this passage here strikes most deeply at our American spirit because we want everything now. We don't have any sense as a culture, hardly at all, of delayed gratification, right? I've got four young kids. I'm constantly trying to teach them how to have delayed gratification. You know, let's, let's uh, save this birthday money so you can add it to your Christmas money and then buy the bigger Lego set or We'll do that with your allowance or whatever, right? We want everything now. Everything must be, we want to both plant and reap uh, at the same time, right? But this is saying there is a time to plant, verse 2, and then there is another time in which you reap. But we want everything now. Arcade Fire, their, their whole album, one of the most, their, I think their most recent album was called Everything Now. And in the, the title song for the album, every inch of space in my heart is filled with something I'll never start. Right? There is a desire to have everything now, and yet there is an inability to start and consume all that we want. Right? That's why we look at Netflix and we scroll through for 30 minutes trying to figure out what we want to watch. <laughs> we, we, we want everything now, and then we feel this glut of, and this inability, this paralyzing desire that I want everything now, but then I can't figure out how to, to decide what I want, right? We want everything, and yet what the Lord is saying in his wisdom is there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time for some things that are good for us, and there's a time for bad things that feel negative to us. None of these categories are inherently sinful, but there is a time in which we have to go through both, go through all, every aspect, there's a reason why the Lord determines each season, because he in his infinite wisdom understands what's, what season is best for our souls to experience his good gifts right now. And so when the Lord determines a season that we are in, the, the heart of humble joy looks at each season and says, what is God's good gift for me to enjoy now? It may be a negative season of life. It may be a positive season of life. But if it is from the hands of a good God, 
who has designed this for our good, then we can, this, this whole thing is set up like a song. This whole thing is almost kind of like a poetic song that we sing. I mean, literally, Paul Simon and the birds put it to, the, to music. And we respond to each moment, each song, each moment in life with a, a song to capture a humble joy of dependence and gratitude for what the Lord is doing in our lives. Right? That's why here we have the Psalms right in the middle of the Bible that captures each of these moments in our lives. It captures what is, uh, what is God doing and giving in our lives. And that doesn't mean that everything has to be like hunky-dory, like um, great praise songs, right? There are a lot of somber and you might say minor key psalms in the Psalter that still look and depend on the Lord for his hand and lean towards a humble joy in whatever God is leading us through. This is often, frankly, my, my job as a pastor is really to help people understand what season God has them in and what is a, depend, a faith-filled dependence look like in that season. Right? These are some questions that you could ask. What season has God placed you in, and how can Jesus lead you to sing life's joys for that moment? You can take that to your small group or your friends. I think it's a helpful question to get, get others' thoughts on because often we don't, we don't have enough self-awareness to realize, like, uh, I'm really actually in a very stressful season right now, and I need somebody to help walk beside me. Some of us have self-awareness, but many of us don't. We need people to help us actually get perspective because we want to say, I'm in this season, but I'm not in that season because that season would be really bad. When the reality is God's placed you in whatever the season is, for you to find a humble joy dependent upon him. So we're going to move on because we we don't want to belabor this too much. But ask these questions of your friends, ask of your missional community, which season do you think God has placed me in? Because then you can begin to have the conversation, how can we find a humble, joyful song to sing together in this moment? We're going to move on to the rest of the, to the next verse, section of verses, verses 9 to 13. And we're going to pick up what does humble joy look like, loving God's mighty works. Humble joy meditates on good, God's good gifts, which is maybe where you were kind of thinking we were going anyways from our conversation here. Verses 9 to 13, when we read this for us, what gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has uh, done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to mankind. Right? Picking up here, beginning of verse 9, what gain has the worker from his toil? You should, as we work through this, uh, I've found this helpful from my conversation with Peter this last week. We must always be asking, what is the reference point to what was said earlier in the book? So earlier in the book, verse, chapter 1, verse 3, the preacher or the teacher says, what, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, what does man gain from all the toil at which he toils under the sun, right? This category of gain is, it runs kind of uh, hand in hand with the question of the value of our toil, our work, our labor that's hard, all through the book of Ecclesiastes. But remember, this, this category of gain is basically saying there's no gain, right? And you might ca- phrase it like, what's the edge that we get from all our toil, right? And the, the implied answer is there's no, there's no edge, Right? This is why in whatever work you have, whether it's you know, working at, at the grocery store, whether it's being a mom at home or a dad at home, whether it's you know, working at your company, managing a bookstore, being a lawyer, managing hedge funds, uh, whatever it is, we all have within each of those industries people who think that they're better than other people because of the success, the success they've had in their work. That's them living out this sense of, I've gained something by my toil. And we all just kind of look around the room and say, What is up with this guy or this lady, whatever it is? There is no gain. There is no edge that we get from all of our toil, right? And yet that does not mean that our work or various occupations, right, unless you're a hitman, right, there's all some type of good within them, 
right? There is a good thing that God has given to us in each of the ways in which he has. You see, I have seen the business that God has given, right? The other translation you could use for that, the preoccupation, right? The the sphere of work, the of labor that God has given you, whether it's cutting grass or being a lawyer, these are all good things. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and think that we've now added to our identity by being this or that, right? There is no edge that we get, but there is still a good that we're invited to, whatever the work is that God's given to us. And that's why verse 11, he says, look, this is what's unique about humans, man or woman, we are all given this sense of there is good in the world, but there's, this is not enough, right? This is what he says. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, or you might say the, the sons and daughters of Adam. Their heart, he has put eternity, which is to say uh, we each ask the question, is this enough? Is this all there is? We can't find the end of everything that we do, right? If you're a carpenter, right, you cannot find, I don't know how, to, I, I'm usually stepping out into a land I know nothing about, but, you know, the best way to design and construct uh, wood and construction, right, there is never an end for how to improve what you can do, right? If, if you're a lawyer, there is never an end to the amount that you can uh, study and cases that you can um, win, there is always something more, right? If you're in a relationship, you will always be disappointed by your partner if they are the end of the relationship, right? They will always disappoint you. That's why this question comes, is there something more? Is this all there is? Because within each of our hearts is this, uh, St. Augustine called it, this God-sized hole that we cannot fill by anything else. This is the sense of eternity that there is, we are unique among all animals in the world, that there is something that drives us beyond the mere survival from one day to the next. There is something that must fulfill us more deeply than simply doing the, the root activity of whatever our work is. And so verse 13, he picks up, or verse 12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Also, that every, everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. This is God's gift to you, that whatever he has called you to be, a photographer, a stay-at-home mom or dad, working out in the, in the world, whatever it is, it is a good gift that God has given you. So where has God set you in life? What has he given you? That's the place that you need to then sit and meditate and say, God, what are the good gifts that you've given me here? I'm at home with kids. God, these kids want to drive me nuts. Those are my, my weaknesses and sins are constantly in the forefront of my mind. And yet God has given you lives to steward towards maturity. He has given you the capability and the strength to provide for human beings that reflect his image. And then of course, we all have these little moments through the day that we kind of put on Instagram of little ways in which our kids, you know, uh, <laughs> I think of Silas this last week. Um, he was saying something to my wife about how, this is my third son, something along the lines of, Mommy, uh, I'm glad that, that you get to be uh, my mommy, that you're, the, you're, the, you're a great mommy because I'm your son. You know, basically saying, like, uh, Mom, your value is in I'm your son, and it's specifically me, right? When you're the middle child, of course, you have to make it about you. But God has given us these good gifts, and we need to meditate here. This is what he's doing. He's meditating. Okay, God, how have you designed what you've given me to be for my good? Here, I want to throw these verses up on the screen because you can see this verse 13 and say, okay, also everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil and think, well, didn't, didn't the Apostle Paul directly address this? We just finished 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 32. What do I gain if humanly speaking, I fight with the beast at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, then let's say, let us eat, drink for tomorrow we die, right? That feels very similar to this passage, doesn't it? This sense of, uh, look, life is just kind of meaningless and we're going to die anyways, so let's just take it all in. Is that what this verse is saying? Actually, the, the place in 1 Corinthians to tie this verse would actually be uh, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 31. So whatever, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? This is where he is aiming at with this. 
so also everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man, right? There is something that God has given to you, whether it's simply air to breathe or food to enjoy, um, a great steak or a really well-flavored tofu, if that's your thing, right? God has given each of these things to us, right? Which, again, if you're remembering, there are echoes from the first chapters of, of Genesis that are in this. And the echo here is just simply chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man and said... You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. God's gifts to you are his invitations to enjoy God himself. So that requires us to meditate. What has God given me? Whether it's running and feeling God's pleasure, whether it's cooking a great meal and feeling God's pleasure, where has God placed you in this life and given you good gifts to enjoy God himself? One of the great things about the Bible is that it shows us that God is not stingy about pleasure. God himself loves, he is enjoyment himself and loves for us to enjoy him. So all these gifts that God's given us, whether it's food or sex or work or anything, are all ways in which God has invited us into the pleasure of God's eternal, infinite enjoyment. So where has God given you good gifts to be enjoyed? The invitation of this passage Humble joy meditates on God's good gifts. Let me just touch on one thing and then we'll move on. One way in which this passage helps us as Americans, and I think just as human nature, we are constantly thinking, over there is something better than what's right here. I, might, I, w- I would call this the greener grass conspiracy, right? Stephen Altrogi wrote a book about this about 10 years or so ago. But there is a sense in which somehow God is not giving me his best here. God's best for me is over there. You know, it's not a problem to move. It's not a problem to, to seek to improve your life or to do whatever you need to do to, to make wise and careful decisions to, you know, improve your life. That's not what this is about. But there was sometimes this sense that, you know what? My life really stinks right now, and God's best for me is someplace else. God may be calling you to move someplace. That's not what we're talking about. But what we are addressing here is this internal um, discontentment with what God has given you. God has given you himself and good gifts to enjoy right where you are, and they are not on the other side of the hill, so to speak. So, God has given us songs to sing about humble joy with where we are in life. Humble joy meditates on God good, God's good gifts. Let's pick up here in verse 14 to 15. Humble joy sees God's enduring work, right? So we have been going kind of in and out. There's a, a dance in this passage. I hope you can kind of feel the conversation of seasons of life. Okay, meditate right where you are. And then, right, what's the nature of all this work thing? All right, so verse 14 to 15, humble joy sees God's enduring work. Verses 14 to 15, let me read that for us. I perceived that whatever God, whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God sees what has been driven away. You see, at this, pa- this passage is in many ways um, putting up God's work next to our work, right? <laughs> you read this passage, um, God's work endures forever. Um, my work does not. Uh, uh, God's brand endures forever. Uh, my marketing plan fails within a week. <laughs> Nothing can be added to it. Oh, you can add a lot to my work, right? <laughs> Whatever my work is as a pastor, um, there's a lot of ways in which it is lacking and can be added to. Whatever your work is, yeah, you can do it, Uh, There's always ways to improve. There's no room for improvement when it comes to God's work. It is and it is perfect, right? God, there is nothing that you can take away from God's work. Um, There's a few things. There's always, you know, I'm sure there's ways in which I say things in sermons or counseling or whatever. You know, eh, just take it with a grain of salt. You don't take God's work with a grain of salt. God has done it so that people fear before him, right? The point is this is, right, God's work endures forever. You know what the oldest companies in the world are? Right, I looked it up on Wikipedia. Some of them, like, they go back a thousand years, but they are largely, if they are still around, um, hotels, bars, restaurants, kind of service work stuff, right? 
Rockefeller, the only name, the only way in which Rockefeller is still known today is that he's Rockefeller Center in New York, uh, uh, in Manhattan, right? Rockefeller has long since lost his influence in the world, and he was barely 100 years ago, right? The, the ways in which our efforts fade very quickly is incredible, right? Just as a small example, and I'll probably refer to this later on, The Wizard of Oz. When we think of The Wizard of Oz, man, one of the greatest movies of all time. Did you realize that The Wizard of Oz was based on an entire book series that was written uh, almost about 100 years ago, and the popularity that it experienced is similar to what things like Harry Potter and Game of Thrones has today, right? We think Game of Thrones... Harry Potter books, we all know what they are, right? Whether you read them or not, regardless, you know what they are. They carry this massive pop culture reference. Wizard of Oz, before it was this incredible Technicolor movie, was, was massively popular in the culture, and we have all long since forgotten it, barely remember the movie, don't even like the movie, and we've moved on with our lives. God's work is not like that. It endures forever. God, you see this in verse 14, has done it. And what is God's main work in this world? It is the death and victory of Jesus Christ. This passage, God's enduring work, is not merely for the seasons to cycle through and through. This is where we have to, this is actually one of the most religious passages, so to speak, in the entire book of Ecclesiastes, using lots of God words, lots of religious language, and we have to take that and remember, God is pointing towards something. The entire work of the Old Testament is leaning towards a gravitational force, towards one climactic event, which is captured for in four gospel accounts, and then talked about in detail by all these epistles and then given us this comic book at the very end of the book of of the Bible and Revelation, it all hints and leans towards this one climactic event, Acts 2, verse 22 to 24. Men of Israel, hear these words as the apostle Peter preaching, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God and with mighty works, thinking of not only miracles, but all of these things here in Ecclesiastes, and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held held by it. Do you notice in that passage, Peter is saying, all right, this all happened, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ happened by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It must happen. It was God's intention to happen. It was God's plan to happen, which is to say, whatever God does endures forever. Not only was his death and uh, death and crucifixion for our sins planned, but it was also that God raised him up, the resurrection of Jesus Christ to destroy the power of Satan, sin, and death. That was also God's plan, right? Death is all through the book of Ecclesiastes, and the ultimate answer to how does God handle it is in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see this also in Ephesians 3 where Paul says, right, the unsearchable riches of Christ to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. It was God's plan before all things. And then let's just finish out with Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted Jesus Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus Christ Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These are the things that God planned. Verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. There is a gospel truth in this. That is why the gospel is called free grace. You cannot add to it. You cannot take from it. It is a gracious, loving disposition from the Lord himself who accomplishes your salvation who accomplishes the victory that you so desperately need over Satan, sin, and death on your behalf, and then gives it to you freely, that you receive by faith, which is itself a gift, and it is God's accomplishment for you. That is the liberating power. That is the, that is the humble joy at seeing God's enduring work, is that you see it, and that's all you do. You see it, receive it, enjoy it, love it. You don't add to it. You don't take from it. You just see it. In the face of Jesus Christ. You see, seeing that Christ grounds all of these humble joys and he is the Lord of all creation and upholds everything by the power of his word, that grounds all of these good gifts, not only in God in a general sense, but Jesus Christ in the specific sense. These are all God's 
gifts to you by the hand of Jesus to enjoy him and love him. The questions of our impermanence and seasons of life ultimately find their grounding in God's eternal work, this humble joy that we receive. Because he's given you, this is the response of humble joy. He's, he's given me salvation from my sins and death and everything else. When you get Jesus Christ, you get him and the universe thrown in. A good steak, a great drink, friends and family. These are all extra things that get thrown in on top to be enjoyed because Jesus is the center. And what's end here? We're going to go from this kind of very joyful thinking to a very kind of somber kind of uh, case study. So go with me now as we kind of come down the mountain, so to speak. Humble joy resolves that God's mysteries belong to God. Here's where we're going to end. Verses 16 to 22, moreover, I saw under the sun, again, under that, that phrase, right, these are things that are under the sun, these are under God's jurisdiction, these are under God's sovereignty rule, under the hand of Christ. I saw that under the sun, in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. And what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. And they all have the same breath. A man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place. For all are from the dust, and to the dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward to the spirit um, and the spirit of the beast goes downward into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than a man should rejoice in his work, for this is his lot. Who can bring him to see what, what will be after him? This is a case study, so to speak. We just worked through this massive God's given all these good gifts for us to enjoy, and he's given them for us to enjoy him himself, all these different seasons in life. And as is usual for the preacher, he's like, okay, now that we've gotten this huge picture of God, what about this negative aspect of life, <laughs> right? Let's throw a case study in there. If you've ever been in a good classroom with a good teacher, they're like, okay, here's the main framework. Let's enjoy this. Yep, there's a lot of good things. Now here's this hard thing. And that's kind of what this passage is like at the end of this chapter. We've got this huge framework that God's in control and giving us all these good gifts. And yet, he then he brings up, okay, now let's deal with the hard stuff of life, Okay. Ecclesiastes in this passage is not condoning injustice, but is calling us into this conversation. How do I live in a world with a good God who gives good gifts and a God who oversees the evil that is happening, right? That's verse 13, or I'm sorry, verse 16. I saw under the sun in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, right? This, how do we live in a world like this, is a season two. And Ecclesiastes in the hands of the modern commentator, is basically saying, with John Wick, rules, without them, we'll live with the animals, right? If you've ever seen John Wick, that's one of the main points. Rules, without them, we live with the animals. That's basically what he's saying. Look, animals die, you're going to die. Everybody will face the ultimate justice of God. Now, how do you live in that reality? All right, this is verse 20. I'll go to one place for all are from the dust, and to the dust all return. I'm sure that you are hearing in that the echo of the curse in Genesis 3.19. You are from the dust, and to the dust you will return. So who can bring someone to see their end in life, right? Who can give us wisdom for this? There are a lot of painful things that do not get a resolution in this life. There are a lot of things that seem deeply wrong that do not get their resolution in this life. That does not to say that we don't fight for justice and that we don't press towards justice, we don't vote for justice, that we don't campaign for justice, that we don't um, speak up for those who are marginalized and oppressed and weak. We do all those things. But if we do them in an obsessive way that makes them where we find our joy, we will miss the lesson of Ecclesiastes 3. Do those things. Commit your way to them. But draw your joy from the good gifts that God's given us. That's basically what this passage is saying. 
It's saying humble joy resolves that God's mysteries belong to God. God, I can only do what you've given me to be responsible for. I'm, I'm not responsible to change my ex's hus- my ex heart on how they are affecting my children. I'm, I, I can't control how my children are responding to this situation or that. I can't control how my company is responding to the pandemic. I can't control that it feels like we always have season after season corrupt politicians on the left and the right and the center always in control. I can't control these what feels like injustices. But here's what I can control. You have given me good things in this life to enjoy. The fact that I'm alive, the fact that I can enjoy these things, these are your gifts to me. It's a mystery how this world gets put together. That's why I'm often very grateful that I'm not God. Because I would like to be, and that's probably a bad thing. God is the one who has put this whole world together. And we have to be resolved with this mystery that, you know what? To the searching out of all answers, there is an unend- there is an unending journey for all humans. Except for God. He is the one who holds all the answers. And he's not given them all to us. We work joyfully. We enjoy God's good gifts to us. Again, another echo of uh, Genesis here. If you see there in verse 22, right? Nothing is better than for us that we should rejoice in our work. That rejoice in our, in his, in our work, is that phrase is actually the very phrase or similar to it, an echo of Genesis 1 at the end of every creation event that God does, every creation day. It says, God saw that it was good. See that the work in your life that you do, children, work, whatever it is, it's a good gift. And you're actually being like God when you take a moment and enjoy it. That's God's gift to you. Everything else, the hard things, it doesn't mean that there's not hard things. But the emphasis here is is on trusting the mysteries to God and in leaning towards enjoying the work that he's given us. This passage is, frankly, it it ends in a way that um, it leaves us in a place that is very similar, and this is where we're going to end, to Psalm 131. Psalm 131 reads like this. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child on its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I don't know if you've ever seen a child, a a little baby, um, when it's not weaned with its mother. It's just grabbing at its mom, just trying to get get some food every left and right, just constantly yearning and just totally totally bonkers and nuts. But a weaned child, no longer nursed, just sits very quietly, joyfully receiving from its mother, enjoying the love and affection that they have together, just sitting peacefully and enjoying the good gifts of life, right? And as a little baby, it has no responsibilities. It doesn't have taxes. It doesn't have a job. It's got nothing. It just sits there and enjoys, right? This passage is here to remind you, to draw us into this great wisdom in life. There could be a total chaos around you. God has still given you good gifts, and the response to each season in life is to humbly, uh, to find humble joy and love God's mighty works. Would you pray with me? Father, would you give us a quiet soul within us to humbly enjoy your good gifts to us? Father, we need you, and you have lavishly and excessively loved us and given good gifts to us. So I pray that we would respond with humble joy in what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For our benediction, receive Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child on its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. I pray that as you go this week, that you would humbly enjoy God's good gifts to you and that you would find your soul joyfully quiet in God's loving care for you. Would you go now in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.